Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. My name is Chris, and I'm so pleased you are joining me for another sleep story. Before we begin, close your eyes and let yourself breathe deeply as you begin to relax. Inhale and exhale, each time letting your stomach rise and fall, the breath entering and exiting at a slow and relaxed pace. Inhale for three seconds. Hold for three seconds. And then exhale for three seconds. Let's breathe slowly for a count of three once again. Inhale for three seconds. Hold for three seconds. And then exhale for three seconds. And before we begin the story, one last time, just like before. Inhale for three seconds. Hold for three seconds. And then exhale for three seconds. I hope you are feeling calm and are somewhere warm and cozy. Tonight, I want you to listen to a fictional tale, a myth, a legend, and see if you notice any truths in this old story. For this is a tale about humans and gods and non-humans, living things and non-living things, flesh and spirit. Most importantly, this is a story about dreams and reality, of one man's reality which he dreamed to life, and then a reality that was gifted to him by the goddess of love herself. Are you ready to listen to the story? Then, close your eyes and imagine yourself on an island in the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. The water around you is a deep, sparkling blue. It is mirroring the sky above. You know that this land is a land of history, but also a land of myths and legends. Here, warriors fought and died, here, kings reigned and queens were passionately revered. Here, too, you stop to listen to the tales that are told from generation to generation. One of those tales is the story of Pygmalion and Galatea. It was the writer Ovid who made the myth popular in his tales of metamorphosis. And, if you allow yourself to become relaxed and lie still, close your eyes, you can picture every detail of the scenes I am about to describe to you. Long ago, when the world was young, on this magical island there lived a king. Pygmalion was his name, and he was a talented artist and craftsman. Not only did he create great works with pigments and paints, colors from the earth and nature, but he enjoyed fashioning sculptures of marble and ivory. Pygmalion would source the stone from nearby places, and he would hew only the finest, brightest, whitest marble. Pygmalion loved working with his hands, the roughness of a rock chiseled into surrender with his own tools, the geometrical slants eventually curving in rhythm. It was like crafting magic. He loved the determined sounds the hammer and chisel made as they bore into the solid rock, as they crushed deeper and chipped away at finer details. 
his forms took geometrical shape. When Pygmalion worked in this way, it was as if almost in a trance. It would seem that time was nothing and everything. Pygmalion would let himself be swept away into a world that only he could create. The world of his own imagination. With just his imagination, he could take something in his mind and give it form. He could bring it from the state of fantasy, an idea he only thought about silently, to a state of being on the pedestal, a complete work of art. To him, the statues were not merely statues, lifeless and cold, but great states of being, warmed by his hands and warming his world with their presence, grace and beauty. The island where Pygmalion ruled was beautiful enough to feed inspiration for his art. The brilliant sun warming his face and skin as he worked daily on his sculptures, the cool breeze echoing through branches and palms, the occasional song of a bird fluttering about above him. There was nothing Pygmalion loved more than to be the creator of his own world of art. Now, I know what you are thinking. Did Pygmalion have any friends, any family, any lovers? Well, it is possible that he had in the past. Yet, as he grew older and thought himself wiser, he came to see that not all women who threw themselves at his feet were worth his time or attention. There were, in particular, one group of women who tried to take his attention away from the art. They promised entertainment, pleasure, and prosperity. They were the Propoetides, female inhabitants of the island of Cyprus. Although, as a youth, he had sometimes wondered about their behavior and allowed himself their company, Pygmalion soon realized that those women would only waste his time. So much chatter so much playing. It may have been nice in the beginning, but after a few hours with the female inhabitants, all he craved was stillness and silence. Why, oh why, cannot a woman be simply beautiful and not speak her mind so often? He sometimes wondered to himself. Must they always be so loud, so talkative, so inquisitive, so annoying? Still, he could not deny the beauty, no, the perfection of the female form. He could not deny that looking upon the curves and shapes and supple, tender skin of a woman made him feel as if he were in the presence of an energy greater than himself. Art was life, indeed, and when the women came to him, he felt that he had never seen a more beautiful, perfect, spotless work of art. Here, then, was a problem. He admired women, but did not need their reality in his life. He did not need to seek out a wife. He could feed and clothe himself. He had enough riches, and he did not see why other men let themselves become enslaved to what he liked to call desires of the flesh. Oh no, Pygmalion was far above that. Also, he reckoned, he had only desires of the soul to create great art to be surrounded by his art, to live with his art, day after day after day. Oh, and after all, no woman is entirely flawless. Pygmalion comforted himself. 
Every woman I have met, at least, has one faulty thing about her body that makes her imperfect. On the whole, the female creatures are a work of art, yes. But in truth, I have not found any that are without one tiny flaw. One day, on the island, as he pondered these things, another thought overcame him. Why not sculpt my idea of the perfect woman? He said to himself. Why not render the most flawless form ever known to mankind? I am Pygmalion, and it is in the power of my hands to do so. And so I shall. That night, in the silence of his sacred space, his sculptor's studio, Pygmalion went to work on bringing his idea from inspiration to birth. He started with a simple and ordinary looking block of stone, and then picked up his tools to begin the task of the day. Pygmalion loved being in control of his tools. He loved knowing the outcome of his creative work. Whereas in real life, there were no guarantees. With his designs, he could fashion something that was unmistakably real. He started with a simple and ordinary looking block of stone, and then picked up his tools to begin the task of the day. Pygmalion loved being in control of his tools. He loved knowing the outcome of his creative work. Whereas in real life, there were no guarantees. With his designs, he could fashion something that was unmistakably real in his mind, in his studio, and also in his hands. Pygmalion thought about these things as his fingers traced the stone and marked where he should begin to carve it. He would fashion the perfect woman, he told himself. She would be of unparalleled beauty, and none of the human women, none of the goddesses, none of the female creatures could ever rival her in his world. And so it was, that Pygmalion carved exactly what he wished for. Every part of her form adhered to the geometrical perfection of the female body. Every finger, every toe, every surface of her skin seemed divine. It took a few weeks for Pygmalion to work on his new figure, and as he did so, he rarely stopped to eat, drink, or sleep. He set aside other trivialities to focus on the results of his ivory woman. And one fine day, the work was finally complete, his masterpiece. Pygmalion stepped back from the sculpture to gaze on it as a whole. He had been seeing it up close for the entire duration of his work and this would be the first time to see his work in full perspective. From a distance, he had made it with precision and the exact dimensions of a human woman, a life-size statue. He gasped a little. The statue was immovable, yet it stirred something inside him that none of his other statues ever did. The figure, the woman, was white as milk, soothe as silk, real as day. Pygmalion stepped forward to touch the woman's face with his fingertips. Indeed, she seemed so real, so supple, so alive, he whispered to himself. A strange, unexplainable wave of emotion swept through his body. It coursed from his fingertips, traveling through his hands, his arms, and found its way to his heart. This wave turned to joy and passion. It was the strong feeling he often felt 
when compelled to create by an invisible force. Yet, this time, no other feelings could compare. He felt as powerful as a god. A god who could create a form and give it life. On the corner of his studio was a discarded drape. Pygmalion picked it up immediately and returned to the sculptured figure, setting it around her waist, letting it fall over her legs and accentuating her graceful curves. I shall name you Galatea, Pygmalion whispered in her ear, for you are as white as milk and you give life to my heart in the same way that a mother's milk gives life to her firstborn. Pygmalion decided that his new companion must have accessories fit for a goddess queen. He went to his chambers and found a dazzling necklace of precious stones, gifted to him by his mother. For your future bride, his mother had once told him, Galatea is my future bride, he said to himself, and then returned to the sculpture, bearing the precious ornament. He fitted around her slender neck and watched as the stones hung perfectly between her bosoms. He was a man obsessed. What was this strange spell Pygmalion had fallen into? What were these feelings he was now experiencing? At first, he thought he was in control. Yet now, oh how powerless he felt when in Galatea's presence. Every night and every day, he stayed in his art studio, lingering under this spell, not wishing to be drawn away from it. He could not eat or sleep or speak with any other person. During these days and nights, he sank deeper into a strange darkness. What he first felt as passion and joy turned to overwhelming sorrow and depression. For he was in love with a stone. He, the great king and artist Pygmalion, had outdone himself. He had conceived the inconceivable. He had crafted perfection. He had styled the woman of his dreams. And yet, this was not enough. He was no longer satisfied. The emptiness in his life soon became apparent. The hunger in his heart grew and could not be satiated. The bottomless pit of unfulfilled desire raged like a whirlwind in his mind. Peace would not come. Pygmalion wanted nothing more than to wish this statue to life. He desired to see her not as a lifeless, immovable art form, but a real, alive, and breathing woman. Was it possible, he wondered. Was there some secret magical potion which permitted the dead to resurrect? Was there anything he could do or say, some mantra he might learn that would rouse this sleeping stone and bring his dear, sweet Galatea to life? There is something, he realized one day. The feast of Aphrodite is approaching. Aphrodite, as I am sure you remember, was the goddess of love. Beautiful, revered, renowned in all the land, worshipped in all the land, and across the heavens. Born from sea foam and washed ashore on the island of Cyprus, she ruled over fertility, love, and beauty. Aphrodite was considered a queen, for she had initiated many unions of both gods and goddesses, 
and had affixed marriages between mortals and immortals. The Queen of Love could cause even the hardest of hearts to beat in desire. She could cast her spell of passion over the most bitter of human beings and make them believe in love again. And it was believed that if ever Aphrodite brought together two separate entities in the name of love, their destiny was forever sealed. Nothing, not even death, could destroy their union. Yes, thought Pygmalion. Surely Aphrodite can awaken my sleeping Galatea. He decided to attend the upcoming celebrations, and there, to petition the goddess of love to grant him one wish, to turn his work of art into a real woman, a breathing, living woman. Pygmalion traveled to the festival of Aphrodite to offer the goddess a prayer, a wish. Smoke from adorned altars rose high in the sky, tinged with tears and prayers of all who had come to seek favor with the goddess of love. Incense burned, their odorous flavors penetrating the air. Maidens danced on grassy grounds. Pygmalion walked hesitantly upon these sacred temple passageways. He closed his eyes to worship, and as he did, Pygmalion wept, tears of frustration you may assume, but in truth, they were now tears of sorrow, tears of regret. For in this moment, Pygmalion thought about all the other opportunities he had been given to experience love and passion. He remembered all the maidens he had shunned with his haughty attitude. He recalled all the times he told himself that he did not need a woman to love him. And, in his mind, he chastised himself for such arrogance and ignorance. Could this be my curse? He thought. To live forever, unable to receive love from the only one who possesses my heart? Is this my fate? To suffer the agony of love which can never be reciprocated. Is this my punishment? To fall for my ivory virgin. To wish for her touch day and night and never be able to experience it. What torment. What heartbreak. What pain I never knew my heart was capable of bearing. Pygmalion fell to his knees in remorse and repentance. Ye gods, who can do all things, he cried. You, Aphrodite, who knows all men, their strengths and their weaknesses, I beseech you. Hear my prayer, my supplication, my sin of arrogance and pride. I know now I was wrong in thinking I could live without a lover. Accept my repentant heart, for now I know. What is existence without joy? What is nature without grace and beauty? What is art without meaning? What is life without love? And I, who am I without the woman of my dreams, my Galatea? I am merely a man, a wretched man, a starving man. I am nothing. As Pygmalion spoke weakly, the words he whispered traveled up on climbing pillars of incense smoke. They rose in the atmosphere, passing branches of trees, winding up cliffs, passages, and pathways until they reached the highest peaks of Mount Olympus. There, where all the tears of prayers had gathered, they touched the holy realm of Aphrodite's world. 
I find myself now in love with a work of art from my very own hands. A stone which cannot see or speak or hear, but to me, she is everything. She is life and joy, even though she seems lifeless and soulless. To me, she is fairer than a thousand maidens, and I would give anything to have her as a living, breathing companion. Now, the tears of worshippers, if their journeys had truly begun in one's heart, traveled until they reached the ears of immortal deities. The goddess of love looked down from her throne and noticed the man on his knees. Her attention turned to curiosity, and she longed to understand. That night, when Pygmalion had gone home, the goddess Aphrodite followed his path to his town and further still into his studio. She wanted to see for herself what this work of art was that he spoke of. What could compel a man to such sorrow? What sort of love was this, she wondered. When she beheld the work of the sculpture, she saw that the face resembled her own. For without knowing it fully, Pygmalion had worked with his heart so deeply that the very woman he created looked exactly like the goddess of love herself. Aphrodite was moved to allay his tears and sorrows. She decided that she would grant this lifeless statue life. And so, that is what happened. When Pygmalion came to his Galatea in the morning, he approached her carefully. And, as he did so, she seemed to blink and smile at him. At first, he thought his eyes were deceiving him. His dreams of love and life with his statue were beginning to overcome and overwhelm his mind. He placed one hand on her shoulder to steady himself. To his surprise, the skin was warm and soft to his touch. His fingers found her fingers, and he held the hand of his Galatea. As he did so, the hand moved up in response to his touch. As he gazed upon her face, he found that she was still smiling. Galatea's eyes were wide open now, and they looked straight into his soul. His hand locked in hers, he felt afraid to pull away, lest he wake from this beautiful dream. So, he moved closer instead, to place his lips to her lips, to feel if they too were warm and welcoming. It was the kiss of life, he realized, in that instant, in that unforgettable moment. Galatea kissed him back, breathing close to his face, her heart beat so near to his. As the moments turned to minutes, she still did not disappear. Pygmalion found that he was not dreaming. The goddess Aphrodite must have heard his prayers, seen his tears, and granted him his wish. It felt too wonderful to be true, and he still felt unworthy to be given such a magnificent gift. But it really was true, and he really was holding his deepest love. At last, she had awakened the sleeping Galatea. He had created something so perfect, so wonderful, and it had found favor in the goddess's eyes. Pygmalion swore to protect and love Galatea, to provide for and serve her as long as they both lived. Pure love 
blossomed between the two, and soon they were wed. Their son, Paphos, later went on to build the famous city of Paphos in Cyprus. You could say that their love lived on in the generations that came after them. If you were to visit Cyprus today, you would find a wonderful historical island. Many people still call it the island of Aphrodite. It is as intriguing as its legend. But here, it seems no one is sleeping anymore. It is the third largest and most populated island in the Mediterranean Sea. Mostly sunny, with rare species of animals and plants. It also has some of Europe's cleanest beaches. You might look upon the long stretches of sand, enjoying the sun's warmth or a dip in the ocean. Perhaps you will linger over a late breakfast of freshly baked bread, goat's cheese, and a light salad of cucumber, olives, and tomatoes. Perhaps if you go to visit someday, you too will see artists, potters, or maybe even sculptors such as Pygmalion, who work at their craft with joy and passion. If you have time, you might even visit the site of the ancient temple of Aphrodite, feeling the mystic charm which surrounds the whole island. Cyprus is an island of wonder and mystery. Yes, perhaps if you get the chance to visit someday, you will write your own remarkable story. The story of Pygmalion and Galatea is simply that, a story. Yet, it has fascinated and captivated people all over the world. The Roman poet Ovid, in his poem Metamorphoses, relates one of the oldest, most complete tellings of the tale. The legend also inspired many artists. Jean-Léon Jérôme, whose depiction is widely remembered, George Bernard Shaw's version of Pygmalion, was also the inspiration for Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe's musical, My Fair Lady. And there are many folks who believe it was the original idea for the famous story of Pinocchio, a wooden puppet that comes to life. As you drift off to sleep tonight, I wish that you take from this story whatever you will. We all know that sometimes love is strange. It cannot always be explained, nor are feelings of passion justified. Do you have dreams that you wish you could see come to life? I wish you a restful sleep and a calm, caressed by soothing thoughts and warmed with hope for tomorrow. Good night, until next time.